Sí, está ahí. Ahí está. Está permanente un punto aquí. Sí, aquí no me Hello everyone, welcome to the first ever KT Academy workshop. Today we're here to give you a peek to the upcoming KT Academy event that will, that will take place here at the university. We will also see how you can start your career in open source by contributing to the KT community. This workshop was organized by the University of Macedonia, the open source team of the university, and the KD community. Now let's give a big shout out to our speakers, Nautilus Kolkotronis and Nate Uayan. Nautilus has a ton of experience and knowledge that he's very happy to share with all of us. And Nate, uh, Nate's contributions have been crucial to the success of KD projects, so we're super lucky to have both of them here. And they will give us some great insights about the KD Academy event that will happen on summer and how we can get involved with open source and make a difference to the KD world. So let's welcome now to the night. Thank you. Let's get this workshop started. Hi there, everybody. Thank you very much for attending this presentation entitled Making a Difference, How to Contribute and Jumpstart Your Career in Free Software with the KDE community. So let's, uh, let's begin real fast. I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Nate Graham. I am a current KDE EV board member. For those who don't know, the KDE EV is the nonprofit organization that helps to organize things behind KDE. I have been a, involved in KDE first as a volunteer um, and now as an employed professional for six years now. And I feel very strongly that KDE is going to take over the world and make it a much better place. And now let me introduce my co-presenter, Neofitos. Thanks, Nate. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Neofitos Kokotronis. As you might have guessed from that, I come from Cyprus, but I currently live in Athens, Greece for the last five years. Uh, in my day job, I'm uh, the head of product and services at a management consulting company specializing on topics like innovation and digital transformation. It's called Foundations and Foundation, and it's based here in Athens. Uh, I've been a contributor to KDE for nearly six years now. Started co contributing as a member of the promo team, soon switched to leading the goal of streamlining, streamlining the onboarding process for the KDE users and new contributors. And I've been in the recent past part of KDE's board of directors as well. I'm not a coder, if that means anything to you. I'm mostly involved in the community, working on organizational and community topics within KDE. So, Nate, I guess you can pick it up now. Thank you. So let's get started here. Um, let's start by talking about what KDE is. Uh, perhaps some of you in the audience have heard of KDE before, and that would be amazing. But even those who have might not realize just how large and broad and deep KDE is uh, in terms of its history and also in terms of its impact, both historically and also continuing today. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that so that we can all be on the same page regarding why, at least why we think KDE matters. So first of all, what is KDE? Uh, KDE is an international software community of people who make free software. KDE started in 1996 by building a desktop environment at the time called KDE, which has now been renamed and rebranded to Plasma, which is a, a graphical desktop environment. And since then, KDE has branched out and also creates Plasma Mobile for phones. KDE has an enormous suite of apps that it publishes, which can be used for any purpose under the sun, practically, including some very large ones you might have heard of, such as Krita, uh, Kaden Live, and KStars. Krita is a professional painting app. Kaden Live is a professional video editing app. And KStars is a professional astronomy and telescope driving app. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about those later. In addition, KDE also publishes a set of development libraries that developers of C++-based apps can use to have an easier time doing development that are used in the industry. 
Uh, KDE also publishes the KDE Neon Linux distro, which makes it very easy to get KDE software and to use Plasma as a desktop environment. And this just kind of touches the very basics of what KDE has done over time, but I think it will suffice for the moment. So Nate has already explained what KDE develops, uh, that we develop a wide variety of software. Uh, maybe one question is, why do we do that? What are we trying to achieve? Of course, it's global domination, as Nate already mentioned, but uh, maybe to answer this, uh, you can have a look at the ma our manifesto, our vision, and our goals. Uh, all of these are things that help us define our values and how we work together. They give us, uh, let's say, a path how to, we want to move forward. It's like a compass for us to follow, if I can say that. So if you look at our manifesto, you will see words like openness, like inclusion, like availability to everyone, uh, innovation. We want and we try to do things in the open. We want to do things in engagement with our community and our users. We work collaboratively. Uh, and our vision is to change the world toward what we believe is important as KDE, but as also as individuals. Um, and as you can he see here in our our vision on how we define it. It's a world in which everyone has control over their digital life and they enjoy freedom and privacy. Again, uh, these are words that were carefully and intentionally chosen by the community when we were working on our vision. So we're doing this for everyone. We care about our digital lives. We care about freedom and privacy going forward. And the impact all of this will have in the humanities, if I can say that, future. So in addition to the above, for the last five to six years, we also choose uh, selected goals every couple of years, uh, which our community suggests, and we all together vote upon them. So we do this in order to help our community with, let's say, high level focus of what, we, what do we want to work on for the next years? What do we want to improve upon? Where do we want to put, uh, let's say, our energy and efforts? So. The, this set of goals have been changing. We started back in 2018. We had a new set of, call, of goals in 2020. And now uh, our latest, let's say, goals, which were avoided at last year's academy in 2022, maybe I can quickly go through them. One is KD for all, and it's about boosting accessibility for so can, more people can enjoy what we do, no matter of any issues they might have. Uh, we want to increase our inclusion. Uh, it's about building sustainable software. Uh, we all know about the climate change being a, probably the biggest challenge the world is facing at the moment, and we want our software to be as environmentally friendly uh, to the extent possible as possible. And the third one is automation. Uh, we want to improve, let's say, our internal processes uh, in order to uh, increase the quality of our software and uh, the the products that we deliver to our end users. So uh, all these are things that help us and drive us forward, and hopefully they will inspire any of you that are, feel like they are potential contributors to what we do. Thank you. Oh, and uh, let me mention something I briefly forgot earlier, which is if there are any questions, uh, we're going to leave those until the end. We've scheduled some time at the end to answer questions from people in the local audience as well as the remote audience. So if anybody would like to type some questions, we will be answering all of those. So uh, yeah, hold those until the end. Um, so moving on, I think we both briefly talked about how today has shaped, uh, how KDE has shaped today's world, but let's go into it in a little bit more detail now, because it turns out KDE has had quite a big impact over time. And I'd like to start with one interesting piece of history that folks may not know because this isn't as widely understood as I, as I think it, it ought to be, but KDE has basically created the foundations of the entire modern web. And the way that this happened, it started way back in the late 90s with the creation of a web rendering engine called KHTML that was created by KDE inside KDE for KDE's web browser, which at the time was called Conqueror, this one down here in the top, uh, in the bottom left, bottom right, <laughs> excuse me. And 
Conqueror was a very successful early web browser, and KHTML as its rendering engine was also a very successful rendering engine. So much so that in the year 2001, Apple decided to use KHTML as the basis for its own web browser that it was developing at the time, which would later turn into Safari. For several years, Apple contributed to KHTML and upstreamed their contributions. And after a couple years of that, they decided to fork it, ultimately transforming it into something that they called WebKit, which continues today as the basis for Apple's Safari web browser and a lot of other ones. But this is all basically KDE technology under the hood. Later, after that, Google decided that they wanted to use WebKit for their web browser, which would later become Chrome, and they ended up forking WebKit into a new rendering engine called Blink, which is now used to power basically all Chrome and Chromium-based web browsers, not only Chrome itself, but tons and tons and tons of others all over the world, all over the software universe, including Microsoft Edge in a very interesting twist of fate. Microsoft has gone from being a major competitor in the browser wars to a consumer of Google technology, which is ultimately based on Apple technology, which is ultimately based on KDE technology. So in this way, every modern web browser, with the exception of those based on Firefox, are essentially built on top of KDE technology. And so in that way, what KDE has done has an ongoing impact in shaping how the entire modern internet is rendered and displayed to people. Yeah, as you will see in the next slide, we're very proud for several things that our community has managed over the, I don't think we mentioned that KD has been around for 25, probably 26 years by now. So it's been around, around for a while with thousands of contributors changing over the years, but you can see we're still here and very active and very proud for the things that our community has achieved over the years. So one of those things that is usually, let's say it puts us in the news and we're very honored as a community to, to have is that our software, uh, the software that the community develops is develops is being used not only by the generic population, if I can say that, you know, from our end users, but also from pro professionals that use it in their day-to-day -day workflows. Uh, Katie, as Kate mentioned, as Nate mentioned, develops a variety of apps that can be used in scientific research. Here you can see some examples. Um, we made it easy for those interested uh, to take a look and see what might be useful for them. So you can see there, we created a pages, a page, a dedicated one, where we showcase all the relevant uh, products that we develop that can help scientists or academics. Um, one big aspect for it that we're particularly excited about is the use of KD software in professional science and research centers. You can see here, uh, to be more specific, organizations like NASA, are using Plasma, which is the desktop on the environment for that uh, KD develops uh, on their computers, sending missions to Mars or other planets, I don't know. Uh, similarly, other organizations doing research on high energy physics, astronomy, things like that are using it to power their systems. This is very, very crucial to us as to an extent it validates the usefulness of the products we develop, right? And how they can be used in work environments and day-to-day -day workflows of professionals, improving the productivity and the efficiency of the people using it. All these organizations that I mentioned and many more, uh, they require features and stability that uh, the KDE software that we develop is in a position to offer that to them. And we are very happy that they choose us. So just to mention here, since we mentioned scientists, we also have similarly uh, similar pages. If you just use the kde.org slash four, and then you will see that we have another web page which is uh, dedicated to creators where we highlight applications that we develop that can be used by people uh, in the creative industry or individuals doing production works or creating content and we also have a page about uh, children uh, this is actually one of our most popular apps uh, that are used by children around the world so if you're interested into that as well there's a dedicated page for that also yeah, thank you for that. Um, one other thing that I will uh, just add to this, Neophytos mentioned that KDE has been there um, in NASA and maybe even in the Mars missions. We, in fact, just discovered confirmation a few days ago that KDE software was, in fact, powering the Mars missions, specifically the Spirit and Opportunity 
um, rovers, not the rovers themselves, but the mission control computers. So it's super duper duper exciting for our technology to be used to be really helping to advance the frontiers of science and human knowledge there. So there's another thing that we can look at regarding how KDE technology and software has had an impact, which is that it's increasingly being used to power tons and tons and tons of retail devices that regular people can go into stores and purchase. Maybe the most famous one these days is the Steam Deck up here in the top right, which is a handheld gaming computer made by uh, Valve Corporation. And this has been a really huge smash hit, selling over a million copies as of last year, maybe even two million now, I don't know, but it seems like it's doing very well. And I would like to, to imagine that at least one of the reasons for this is because it's running KDE software under the hood. The way that this product works is that it's first and foremost a, a gaming tablet, but you can turn it into desktop mode by docking it with your monitor and keyboard and mouse, and then it just turns into a normal computer. And in this mode, it's a normal computer that happens to be running KDE Plasma. So you get a full KDE software experience when you're using it in this mode. And we've gotten tons of feedback that this is a very nice ergonomic way to work. Um, and so we're really very proud that our software has been used in this fantastic product. There are many more that you can see on this link that we have here, kde.org slash hardware. You can see a couple of the other examples of uh, where KDE software has been used. A few others that I have highlighted on this page down here, we've got the Pine Phone, which is a mobile phone by the Pine64 company. This is a really interesting product too that showcases how mature KDE's mobile operating system is becoming. And uh, it's something that is increasingly being used in other products too, that uh, sometimes people have been basing their own software on. There was a unfortunately short-lived tablet called the JingPad that was based entirely on Plasma Mobile. And we expect that there will be many more in the future. And then down here in the bottom right, we have a couple of more conventional devices. We have some laptops and in this case, by uh, Tuxedo Computers, which is a KDE patron, and they ship all of their devices with KDE Plasma at this point in time. So if you buy a computer from them, you always get KDE software. And we have other patrons who also sell uh, hardware with our software, uh, a prominent one being Slimbook, which is based in Spain, Tuxedo being in Germany. And when you buy a computer from Slimbook, you also have the option to put KDE software on it. And the feedback that we get from these partners is that these products sell very well and customers like them. So we're really very honored that our software has been able to find such a, a useful and profitable niche in, in hardware. And personally, this is a, a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, Neophytos mentioned earlier the, uh, the words world domination, which is something that I, I talk a lot about which is essentially the idea of getting KDE software to power every device on planet Earth. This is a moonshot goal of mine. And so every time somebody sells a device with plasma on it or KDE technology in general, we get a little bit closer. Um, and I think the reason why this is important is because unlike normal corporate goals by somebody like Microsoft or Apple, they of course want everybody to run their software too. But when you do so, Ultimately, your freedom is being diminished, not increased. And when you run KDE software on a device, your freedom is being increased. And so really our goal here is to increase the scope of human software freedom by making our software so accessible that everybody can use it, everybody can build on it, everybody can hack on it, fork it, do whatever they want with it. Because we believe pretty passionately that this is how the world of digital technology should go, right? It, it shouldn't be controlled by vendors and locked down and hidden behind paywalls. We think that everything should be open and free. And personally, I think that the best way to achieve this is to make our software accessible to people via physical devices, because these are the kinds of things that normal people like to buy. Most people don't change out the operating system on a device that they purchase. And so I think it's very important that we 
be very friendly to, to vendors. And so far, there's a lot of evidence that this, this star of this project is increasing and we have an increasing number of vendors who are interested in doing this. So yeah, if you're interested in buying a device that has KDE software on it, check out kde.org slash hardware and see what's over there. Good, so we mentioned several times that KDE develops many applications as part of our software line. So uh, we want here to introduce quickly some of the most popular apps our community develops. So maybe you can all start to understand the broadness of our products and the types of users we have. Uh, as we, I think we mentioned it, but KDE is an umbrella community and organization, right? So if we don't develop one product for one particular set of users, we develop probably hundreds of uh, applications and uh, that might have different end users from children to designers to content creators and things like that. So first up, you can see here Krita. See, Krita is a very successful training application for prof prof professionals, but uh, also enthusiasts. It's, it's used by thousands of artists across the world in order to create digital paintings and artwork. Uh, the the product itself and the people that uh, contribute to it have managed to create a big community of artists that use it, that provide feedback, that help with its development. As we mentioned earlier, all this is done collaboratively and with engaging our community. So many of these artists that are using Krita, they make a living of the art of the artwork they are developing exclusive exclusively with it, or maybe in collaboration with other open source applications and tools that you might have here of like Inkscape or GIMP and similar ones. Um, Krita as an application has a bunch of powerful features that many proprietary applications are lacking and we know that uh, there are already universities that where it's been used in teaching in fine art courses and you know developing the future uh, painters. So if you are an artist or a creative type that you want to develop your own, let's say, comic or uh, some sort of visual art, I'm sure you will appreciate all the, possibilities, all the possibilities that Krita offers. Uh, we can move on to another very successful app of ours, Caden Light. Uh, it's a very popular application. This is a professional video editing application that everyone, including you, can use in order to edit your videos either for you know your personal use or for something you want to do as part of your job. Uh, we're very happy that Caden Light has very recently completed a very successful crowdfunding campaign. This will enable its developers to spend even more time on these projects, you know, take some time off from their day job and move it into Caden Light, which is very important for us uh, as we want you know our contributors to work more on developing the apps that we're already using and put in more effort. So Funding campaigns like this really uh, help in that front. So these developers can now improve the application, offer more features, more stability to their users, and you know increase their use base as well. Uh, you can download Kaden Live now on your computer and use it for any of your video production needs uh, you might have. It probably has more features that you can use of. You can create a movie with it. You can edit a video to upload it on uh, the side of your preference. You can maybe want to make a fun video compilation of your photos or whatever. Any case you can see of off, Kaden Live can deliver on that front. And we're very proud of uh, what of Kaden Live and the team that is uh, producing it. And then the third app that we wanted to present to you today is G Compre. Uh, it's it has a, a completely different uh, you know target group uh, in, compared to the other ones that we mentioned. It offers free educational games for very young children. I think it's between 2 and 12 years old. It might not sound very impressive to you, or you, you might see the picture here and see, okay, it's something simple, but it, it's worth mentioning that this is one of the most downloaded KDE applications across our lineup, both on desktop, but also on mobile and tablets a lot. Personally, I have a 15 year uh, months old son. I use it already daily for him to play, you know, turn some cards, play some soccer on it. He learns lots of stuff through it throughout the day. And it's worth mentioning that the community there and the people developing are very open to feedback. So if I found a mistake or something in the application, I can quickly make a bug report, suggest a feature request, and then it, they are very responsive and they, they are very quick to you know, adapt and you find the fix 
or they improve them in the next uh, version. Uh, just a few years ago, we learned by accident that GCOMP is being used in public elementary schools across several districts in India, which is very, it was, we're very excited. You can imagine uh, learning about that. I think it was by accident because we saw some Instagram, ha Instagram hashtags with the, with the GCOMP hashtag that we didn't expect. And then we realized that there was this whole new world of people using GCOMP. If you, you know India is probably the biggest country by now in terms of population. And uh, we're very excited to see that uh, 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 GCOMP is being used in the schools. Teachers are using it to educate children. And uh, this means a lot to us. It means our help our software is helping people across the world. It's been used by hundreds of children every day and they learn new things, they improve their skills and, and move on. Um, I see there's been a mistake here in the with the Caden Live link. We can, I guess, send the direct link with GCOMP in the chat. So if anyone wants to check that out. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. No worries. This is definitely not the website for GCOMP. Yeah. So, yeah. Nate, back to you. Yeah. GCOMP is really great. Um, I My children have enjoyed playing it as well. Um, as Neofitos mentioned, it's used around the world in elementary schools. So this is super impactful in a way that may not be obvious that people often don't think about. Um, moving on, those three apps that were just mentioned are really just the tip of the iceberg here because KDE has, if you can believe this, over 200 apps that it regularly uh, produces and distributes and develops. You can go to apps.kde.org to see the full assortment and hopefully find at least one KDE app that will meet your needs. We've got an absolutely enormous stable of apps here. Um, a couple others that I will briefly mention, which um, are very important and widely used. One is Ocular, which is our document reader. Uh, Ocular is a very important app for several reasons. Uh, one, because it is currently the only piece of software that we are aware of that is certified by the German government's Blauer Engel, Blue Angel project for eco-friendliness. So if you are looking for the most lightweight, eco-friendly, officially government certified document reader, Ocular is the one. Um, and this is, brings me to the KDE Eco Initiative which is something that's been going on for a while. And it's also one of our goals, which is to make our software eco-friendly. Um, this is important, not only in a global sense, in the, the sense of saving energy and combating global warming, but also on a personal sense, because if your software uses less, less power and fewer CPU resources, your system runs faster and your devices have much better battery life. So there are many reasons to, to go down this path and many advantages to it. Um, Ocular we've seen is incredibly popular on Windows. It's an app that you can download from the Microsoft Store. And we've seen that a lot of people like using it on Windows because of course, Windows has historically not included its own PDF reader. So this piece of basic functionality for billions of users is something that Kitty can help out with. So that's been a really impactful thing. Uh, some other examples are the Kmail and Cleopatra apps. Kmail um, is KDE's venerable email app. Uh, Cleopatra is a digital certificate and um, codes and signing management app. And we have just learned fairly recently that KDE and Cleopatra are used by um, a KDE patron, G10 Code, which develops the GNU PG software that you might have heard of. And when packaged together in their bundle, this bundle is officially certified by NATO for use with restricted documents, uh, encrypting, decrypting, and storing them. So that kind of blew my mind when I found out about this, that you know we've KDE software has helped humanity go to Mars, and now it is also securing the most secret documents uh, of, of NATO. So that's pretty crazy, if you ask me. And there's tons more apps there. We really, we could go on talking about apps forever because KDE has just so very many of them. Um, but I think we'll, we'll have to move on here. So if you're interested in this topic, I would encourage you to check out the website over here, apps.kde.org, and see what KDE apps can do for you. 
So let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, we've been talking quite a bit about what KDE has done in, a, in an abstract way for people, for humans, for the world. Um, but KDE isn't just a giant altruistic organization. And of course, if you participate in it, there are many personal benefits. Uh, I know Neofitos and I have both had quite a bit of experience here and can share, but it turns out that contributing to KDE can produce quite a lot of benefits for your own personal life as well. Uh, I'd like to start out with sort of a nuts and bolts topic, which is skill building. So KDE is a volunteer organization, first and foremost. Even though at this point, KDE does have a small number of paid developers, and there are some people who are paid and employed to work on KDE software, most KDE activities are done by volunteers. And even those who are paid to work on KDE typically volunteer as well in their free time just because they love it so much. I think that's definitely the case for a lot of people here. Um, I know that's the case for myself as well. I'm employed to work on KDE, but I sought this out specifically because I wanted to do more of it. Uh, I found that the volunteer time was not was not enough for me, so I wanted I wanted to do more. And during my time in KDE, the skills that I've built have been so much more than I imagined I, I could have done during that time because KDE uses industry standard tools. And when you use them and interact with them, you build industry standard skills. So a couple of examples are how KDE software in general is developed using C++, which is an industry standard at this point. Uh, the build system that our software uses is CMake, which is an industry standard. So if you help to develop KDE software, you will be either building or sharpening skills that are very much in demand. And this will make you a much more competitive job candidate. Another thing is that because KDE is a volunteer operation in general, the kinds of people who tend to volunteer tend to be the best and the brightest, the cream of the crop. So when you're working on KDE software and when you're volunteering in the KDE community, you have the opportunity to learn from the best in the industry. You essentially have a free pipeline to some of the brightest minds in the entire contemporary tech field. And it's, it's easy to underestimate how important this is, but you know, when you find yourself hanging around with and spending time with people who are truly exceptional, some of that rubs off on you as well. And I like to think that when people spend time volunteering for KDE, it really helps them to become better skilled and better employees, um, better people in general. Another thing is that because we're here um, at, a, at a university, I know there are many different models of learning, but one thing that you really can do in KDE is you can learn by doing, as opposed to learning in a sort of a classroom setting that can work too. But when you're working on KDE stuff, you're actually working on specific projects. You're, you're not doing something that is sort of abstract and academic. You're really applying skills that you have and that you're learning to specific projects. And when you do this, you get real world feedback from people because those projects matter. Those projects are used and consumed by others. They are um, uh, used by others. And when you do this, there's always a way to improve every single time. And so you can get feedback from actual users um, in, in a very concrete way where people can say, well, this worked for me, this didn't work for me, you know, this, this can be done better. Next time, this was really wonderful. Um, and personally, I found that that very direct feedback that you often have in KDE is something that's super duper duper impactful in helping you to build skills. But another final thing is that you can also go at your own pace because since it's a volunteer operation, there is no boss breathing down your neck telling you to have something done. There's no professor giving you deadlines for projects. Uh, you get to go at your own pace. So if you have a lot of free time and you find a project that you really love, you can put as much time into it as you want. Or if your time becomes more limited or you lose interest, you can work on something else or take a break for a while. Um, and we've seen that throughout KDE's history, this cycle has, has recurred, where we have people who 
volunteer a lot as young people and students. Then they take a break for a while to establish their career. And then they often come back to KDE later uh, and can bring some of their job skills with them to really help amp everything up to the next level. And so there's always, when you're doing things on a volunteer basis, there's always no pressure, basically. So you get to determine how exactly you want to do it. And we, we talked earlier just a moment ago about jobs and job skills. It turns out that KDE is also a really good way to get a job in the industry. Um, I think a lot of people here uh, in, in KDE have had this experience. I know it's certainly true of myself as well, but when you spend time in KDE and you do work on stuff, everything that you do is public. And so it's really easy to see what you do, what you're capable of doing. This makes things a lot easier for a prospective employer because instead of having to guess, oh, can this person do the work? Is this person actually any good? They can just look at your demonstrated history of work. It's all public, right? And they can see, okay, well, is this the kind of person whose pre-existing work uh, fits well into our organization? And so working in open source in general and KDE specifically has historically been a really great driver and predictor of having a successful career. If you look at the slide over in the right side, you can see just a few companies that have historically employed KDE contributors or have sponsored KDE contributors in some way. You've got the Qt company, which is a very important one. KDE software is all based on Qt in the end. And so there's sort of a natural pipeline here. GNU PG is something that I mentioned earlier. GNU PG is the company that works on, um, on GNU PG itself. They use KDE software all over the place. Both of these companies are KDE patrons. Slimbook, which I mentioned earlier in the hardware slide, sells computers that run KDE software. Um, they also are a patron. Tuxedo as well. Um, Blue Systems is my own employer, and we are a software consultancy working on exclusively KDE topics. Uh, it's another KDE patron. There's Sousa, which also has people working on KDE, another KDE patron. Um, and then there's KDAB, Bazascom, and Enokia, Haute Couture, who are KDE supporters, and they have uh, employed people who work on KDE as well. And then finally, we have Valve over in the corner, um, whose work is super impactful to KDE. So, you know, you might recognize some names here. I, I assume some of these companies might be new, some of them might be recognizable, but there's a very rich ecosystem of employment opportunities surrounding KDE. And all of these companies being in KDE's orbit means that there's sort of a natural jumping off point. So if you decide that your work in KDE is really fulfilling and you enjoy it and you want to take it to the next level and you want to do it as more than just a volunteer, there are always ways to make that happen. And your time in KDE can become a very seamless transition into professional employment that can personally enrich you, make the world a better place, and hopefully give you paid time to work on KDE software so that you can keep doing it as a passion project as well. So uh, just to you know, before I continue with the uh, next slide, Nate, uh, one thing that came into my mind, maybe two, uh, one is to share my experience as well, because I'm not as a coder as I mentioned, but still my contributions to KD were very appreciated by my current employer, right? Because uh, being part of KD in the community and running projects for it and being interacting with the community, I got to, you know, uh, increase my skills in community management, interaction, in promotion and things like that. So when I came to Athens back uh, five years ago, I managed to get a job into a startup working with developers back then. And I was responsible for managing, let's say, the online platform well and the community for with it, for the developers. So, even if you are not a coder, if you contribute based on all the things that Nate already mentioned, you there are opportunities that you can, you know, turn this into your favor and all, put all these skills that you received from KDE into use, both in real life but also in your CV, and manage to get uh, a job even in companies that are not directly related to KDE. This is what I wanted to add. Also, one thing that I don't know if we mentioned there uh, later on, Nate, but we haven't mentioned since we're talking maybe to students, the GSOC and season of KDE opportunities that we have. I just, uh, I was just reminded by that. I don't think 
there's currently an open thing, let's say, but may, may, many of you listening are aware of the Google Summer of Code, uh, where students have the opportunity to work on specific projects. KD is usually part of this, uh, in, particularly in the last years. So uh, I think the applications for this year have ended, but if you if you continue being a student and you want to you know, apply in the following years, it's a very good way for new contributors to join us. They get to work with a mentor, they get to work on a project of, that they like, and uh, I think Jusok also gives uh, some payment to some extent for the work we put into it. And at the same time, we have our own season of KD, uh, which again, we open up to external contributors and we try to bring the people in again with mentoring and uh, you know targeting specific goals and specific targets for it. But for students in particular, it's, it's a very good way to get your hands on something that, you know, a product that will get out in the market, a product that has been used already and will give you experience interacting with the community, interacting with developers and, uh, you know, working on something that is doing, is having an impact. So I just want to open that parenthesis. Maybe people are interested. I don't know if our team listening can share maybe uh, some links with for uh, the GSOC or Season of KDE. Um, you know, websites so pe people listening can learn more. Now, moving on to the next slide after that, all that um, as you might have understood uh, by now, by joining and contributing to a community like KD, there are other similar communities uh, uh, at the same time, right? Uh, you will be becoming part of something much la larger, like a bigger ecosystem. Your contributions, your work will be available exactly because of the open source nature of the software. Uh, to millions of users having a global impact. And you now, if you care like we do, you're making a difference in things that matter. And this is like something very, very important for us as well. There's always a technological challenge. There's as well as an innovative aspect of it. But again, a big part of it is why, because we care about the goals, our vision, and we want to improve things uh, for all of us. Um, this by itself, it's a very strong motive for many of our community members and it can be you know a very strong driving incentive for our contributors who often find that you know our vision and our, our goals are things they can get behind and are very satisfied that you know their work supports something bigger something that is part of i can say global movement where many people you know are putting a lot of effort in order to push things forward so moving on to the to the next slide. Um, at the same time, uh, we already talked about the professional aspect of it, uh, the being part of something bigger, but it can also help you as a person and as well as a professional. So being part of an international community with hundreds of contributors, thousands over the year, will provide you with a set of value of skills that to my at least experience are of immeasurable value. Like you learn to say some examples, you learn to work remotely, you learn to work collaboratively within teams, you learn to work using modern development and communication tools, uh, discussing, making decisions in you know diverse environments with people that come from different cultures, different backgrounds, skills, they have other focus or entry points to the communities. All of these are skills that you can put to use in many aspects of your life, not just your professional, let's say, resume. Um, and what it's very important as well, uh, and might often skip it, is the fun aspect of it, right? In parallel, there's uh, the human aspect of being part of a community. There's the fun aspect of being part of a community with similarly, similarly oriented individuals, uh, having fun, for many of us, it's a very good opportunity to be introduced to new people uh, coming from the, all the corners of the world, learning about the new and different cultures, travel to various places where we held our events, uh, we all get together. And I'm, new, I'm pretty sure that if you ask our contributors, new and old, most of them will tell you how, you know, meeting new people, but also coming together with people that you work together maybe daily, but also once a month, depending on your time, is I think one of the most exciting parts of becoming part of our community, like right? getting together with people, meeting them, having fun, and working on things together, right? And putting them out there for people to use. So I think this is a big uh, aspect of 
why people enjoy being part of KDE. And before we move on, um, let yeah. me uh, briefly echo what Neofitos just said. I agree entirely with all of that. Um, personally, I would say that most of my social network and relationships are KDE based at this point. Um, I count, I think I have more KDE friends than I have in-person friends here. So, and, and personally, I find that contributing to KDE is the most fun that I've ever had in my entire life. So there are definitely strong aspects here of fun and community and friend building and purpose. So it's, it's not just dry, boring technical coding, although some people really love that for its own sake as well. But yeah, there's definitely a, a big social and community aspect here. Yeah, and I guess if you are a developer that you like to hide in your basement and just write code, that's perfectly, perfectly fine as well, right? As we mentioned, yeah, right? Of <laughs> diverse community of people, your code will be, contributions will be very well received and that's also welcome. We're just trying to highlight all the various ways that you can benefit or you might enjoy from being part of the community. So I think talking about this, uh, getting together and people, it's a good time to talk about Academy. Uh, it's KDE's annual in conference, it's an international event. Uh, it draws hundreds of attendees from the global KDE community together every year in order to discuss and plan the future of the community uh, and also uh, the technology behind it. So, Academy has a pretty standard structure nowadays, and it's a central aspect of the community. I think it's been around for 20 years as an event now. It has grown, of course, into something bigger than back then when it started. Um, in terms of the practical things, uh, it features a two-day conference, let's say, with presentations on the latest KD developments, but also we often host people from similar projects like ours from the open source community in general in order to talk about their projects or maybe how they are using or implementing KD technologies in their own uh, projects. And then uh, over the, 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 the conference takes place over a weekend for two days and then for the next five days over the week, we have various workshops, what we call birds of feathers, which is got people gathering together to talk on topics. We have coding sessions, like mini hackathons, let's say. Uh, but also we have a lot of community-oriented events, right? Where we get together, we socialize, we drink, we eat, and maybe do some sightseeing, get a, bit, a glimpse of the city and what it has to offer. So it's Academy is a great opportunity to meet KD contributors, but also other people from the ecosystem, other users. You don't have to be a contributor necessarily in order to attend. It's open to everyone. You get to learn about all the latest features, uh, enjoy a great atmosphere, and you know, uh, feel like be part of a let's do think uh, let's do things vibe that usually surrounds Academy. Um, you'll have the chance there to meet our developers, artists, translators, upstream and downstream maintainers, users as I already mentioned, open source enthusiasts, professionals from all over the world. So. This is what uh, Academy is for us. Now, talking a bit about uh, its history and its purpose, uh, Academy is uh, very, very important for us for several reasons. Uh, maybe, ma mainly, excuse me, is it's central to our community as a place to meet. Uh, and we meet together in different locations every time. So we meet between us, but also we meet and learn about new people and new places every year. It is for us a great place to build relationships among our community. We're not just, you know, random nicknames behind the computer. We're actual people in person, and it's always great to put a face in front of these uh, uh, names and nicknames. So it helps us build a, a sense of community to strengthen the bonds between our contributors. Uh, you know, having maybe older and newer contributors mixed together people from different places that they wouldn't have a chance to meet together in under different circumstances. They get together, they interact, they more learn more about each other, what each one does, and maybe they, they are, it's a new opportunity to build new ideas about what KD is doing and where it's going. So in addition, you know, all this people aspect of it, let's say, of the community aspect of it and the networking opportunities. Academy is also important for us for developing our software, right? So this is a key event where most of the developers are there and they talk to each other 
uh, about how to move forward. Having all these people involved in development together at the same place, at the same time, uh, means that many processes can be sped up. You know, difficult topics that maybe have come up in the recent past can be discussed and this resolved. Key decisions about how to move forward can be made that define, you know, the future of our software and our products. So this is a very important aspect of it as well. It's think of it like a sprint uh, if you have, you know, an experience of how, you know, modern companies work on, on projects. And maybe finally, Academy is uh, a place where we have the annual meeting of our membership. Um, I think we mentioned this already, but KDE is supported by an official non-for-profit organization, which is registered in Germany, uh, which supports the community on financial, organizational, and legal matters. So this organization is run by the board of directors that is elected by our members. Uh, I think there are currently more than 100, maybe 120 or 130 active members. Yeah, like 142, I think, something like that. Okay, so a lot of people. Uh, so every year at the Academy, the meeting of our membership takes place where members get to discuss and vote on important topics related to the organization and related to the future of KDE. Um, it's worth mentioning here, just uh, so you know that to become a member, other members of the organization need to vote you in, you know, recognizing your contributions to the community, what you can offer to KDE, what you what you've been, uh, how you have been contributing so far and how you can you can to contribute uh, in the future. So uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, that now that you know what KDE and what Academy are, I think it's a great opportunity to invite you to this year's event taking place between the 15th and the 21st of July in Thessaloniki, in Greece at the University of Macedonia from where we have many people watching us right now and that have helped us set up this workshop. Um, to give a personal touch as a person living in Greece for many years, I'm personally very happy that this event will be coming to Greece. Uh, it's never been, hold, been held in Greece over the uh, 20 years that it's been taking place. So again, I would like to thank the people from the university and the open source team there that helped us with this. Um, it's a unique opportunity for all of you listening to learn more about KD, get to meet our community, get to meet our contributors, and of course, get involved, see all the various aspects uh, that you can get involved. So if this sounds like something that would interest you, would excite you, free, feel free to go at the link share, shared here, register to our event, it's free, and we will be happy to meet you in person in Thessaloniki in two months from now and oh, it's so soon <laughs> yeah it's already uh and i guess since we're speaking of you know getting involved i'll switch back to you nate you know to so we can inform people about the various ways that you can get involved in the kde and become part of this community so we've talked a lot about how kde is mostly a volunteer organization and this is definitely true because of this KDE is fueled by the passion of people who use it and like it and make sure that it, uh, its software works really well. So KDE has always been very, very, very interested in getting people onboarded and involved. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you can get involved yourself if any of this sounds interesting to you. So first of all, we have a web page here that you can check out. This is our general get involved page, community.kde.org slash get underscore involved. And on this page, you can see a whole bunch of different ways that it is possible to get involved. We've mentioned development, of course, because KDE is a software uh, institution and we produce software and so development is very important, but development isn't the only thing that goes into software. Uh, there are other important things like design, like testing, like QA, like translation, like icon work, like promotion in the wider community. Uh, there's so many different ways to get involved. So. If that's something that's interesting, I would encourage you to check out this link. Um, one thing that I'll briefly talk on is 
my personal experience and my sort of pipeline of getting involved. So uh, I started in using KDE software regularly in the year 2017. And I started using it, really enjoyed it, but I found some issues and bugs and things that could be improved. And so I started submitting bug reports and bug reporting is a really great way to get involved because this is um, in addition to a way to get personal issues fixed by bringing them to the attention of developers, it's also a first way for you to have contact with the community and be speaking with members and start to build social relationships. And once you've started to submit bug reports, at a certain point, you'll start to notice that not all of them are getting fixed immediately because there are never enough resources for everything, right? And so what I did at this point is I started moving into what's called bug triage, which, which involves filtering bug reports to find ones that are actionable from ones that are not actionable. This is something that anybody can do. This doesn't really require any technical skills, um, just organization and interest, really. Um, one of the things that I discovered when I started doing this was that one of the reasons many bug reports were not fixed promptly was because there were simply too many bug reports that were old and out of date and not relevant, not actionable, had been fixed many years ago. Um, and simply being a person who can go through those and say, well, this has already been fixed. You know, this, this one is not a KDE problem. It's, you know, a problem with the app. That's a very impactful way that anybody can get involved. Um, in the process, you can be helping others. Uh, another, another way to help others is by talking to users directly on, uh, KDE's forum discuss.kde.org. There's also a very popular subreddit, the r r slash kde subreddit, who has, which has at this point, I think over almost or over 100,000 subscribers. So there's a lot of people there and people have questions. So simply helping people with their, with their issues uh, is another great way to get involved. There, in addition, is a very active visual and user interface design group within KDE. So if you like visual design or human computer interaction, there are many opportunities to get involved here and have a really big difference, uh, make a really big difference because KDE historically has been very technical. Uh, we have lots of developers, uh, rarely a, a, a major shortage of them, but we can always use people with a good eye for design, whether it's visual design or, or human computer interaction and user interface design. So that's another great way to get involved. Translation, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to come back to that now, is, is very important because, you know, here we are, I'm giving, we're giving this presentation in English. Um, all of us here are fortunate enough to be able to communicate in this language, but there are many languages on planet Earth, and it's very important that people be able to understand KDE software in their native language if they don't speak English. Uh-oh, have I frozen? Uh -huh. I Anybody can hear you at least finally. Okay, that's good. Um, and so, yeah. this, is, this is what I get for... Uh, for running running Plasma 6, which is unreleased and early pre-alpha. Oh, everything came back. Okay, great. Um, so as you can see, I'm I'm a little bit on the on the wild side when it when it comes to to this. Anyway, um, as I was I saying, we did test this right. It's another way to go. So <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, as I was saying, translating KDE software into your native language is another very impactful way to make a difference. Uh, this has the potential to open up the use of KDE software to millions, perhaps even hundreds of millions of people. Uh, we, we've had the experience that KDE software is often very well translated into European languages, um, but less so into languages uh, of the rest of the world. And so especially if you speak a sort of a, um, a uh, a language of somewhere from Asia or Africa or the Middle East, or even a um, less common European language. It's a huge way to make a difference very quickly. Uh, and then, of course, as we mentioned, you can come to Academy. Academy is a great way to have a meeting of the minds, to meet people and make new friends and learn how to contribute. 
by having personal experiences and talking with people and learning in, in person. So if that's uh, a way that, that you would like to get involved, then you can do that. Um, and for those of you who are in person, it's going to be held at your university, so you don't even have to go very far. Good. So we already mentioned that our community and users, uh, it's international, right? Which means by default, it's decentralized and we work remotely, asynchronously uh, ever since KDE's conception many years ago and far before it was a trend due to the pandemic and things like that. So we've been doing remote uh, work collaboratively and very productively for several decades now. Um, so to achieve this, uh, just so you know a bit how we're structured, we have built and set up our infrastructure. We have a, a system administration team that helps a lot with that in order to correspond to our needs. So here you'll see some tools that we use in order to collaborate uh, uh, together um, on our product. So we use, let's say, invent.kde.org. If you go there, you will see our GitLab instance. It's hosted there. We host our code. We are after one open source project. So there you can check up all the actual development that takes place, review commits, download the code, play with it, send merge requests, suggest changes, all those of things you can do via invent. You just need to apply maybe for an account and then you can start contributing. So moving on to our communications, we use a matrix instance. If you're not aware about matrix, it's an open source protocol for communications. Uh, KD again hosts its own server where members of our community can create channels to talk to each other, you know, regarding the development of our software or maybe other topics that have more relaxed discussions on topics of their interest. So if you go to webchats.kd.org, you can yourself join via the web interface as well, any of these channels that you like. You can find the development for the projects we talked about today. You can find community channels. You can find the design group. and things like that. Um, we also have our infrastructure for holding video meetings and in the last couple of years we also held our the academy online through it and we still offer it uh, you know virtually for people that can attend in person so here it's what we're using today as well it's our self-hosted instance of big blue button another open source uh, video calling software we're an open source community so we try to consume ourselves open source products right and we're very happy to use things that other people have developed that we like um, so again, this is a, a very useful tool. It's also a very useful for educational purposes. I don't know if your university uses it, but it can be used in that, in that purpose as well. And of course we have our mailing list. Uh, technologies has moved on a lot, but the traditional email seems to be replaceable nowadays. Uh, we have mailing lists, uh, both for our community topics, but also for development and for all the various projects that are being developed by our community there is discussion about moving this forward but for now you can find all these links into our get involved page and they these are in place in order to help you know our communicate our community to collaborate and to work together and deliver its software um so moving on uh it's worth mentioning i think we already uh, came back to it a lot many times uh we're a large community with many topics, and as you might understand, not everyone works on everything. So inevitably, there are many, many teams split into KDE, uh, and are, they are created around the software they develop or the topic or the focus that contributors have. So this means that if you want to join, you will most likely find something that is of your interest. You might be interested in an application that has to do about your children. You might be interested in an application that helps you create content. You might be interested in the interface, in the visual design, about translation that, Kate mentioned, that Nate mentioned earlier. So here you can see various teams that we currently have, but of course there are much, much more. There are like dozens of them. So just to quickly go through them, frameworks Nate already mentioned, it's the, are the libraries that KDE software is built upon. So if you are interested in maybe a bit more low level coding, if I can say that, the, those are ways that you can contribute we are joining that team also we have dozens of applications some of the most popular ones we saw earlier uh, there are much more to them so you can join any application you like contributing one thing we always like to suggest is that's by something you enjoy doing like if you like an application and want, want to help 
improve it, start there. It can be with some translation, it can be with some back triaging or whatever. But if you are working on something that you use and you see it being improved and you see your changes and your commits being shipped in the next version, it's very self-fulfilling. And at the same time, it, it, keeps, it keeps you motivated and then you can move on from there to other things as well. Uh, then there's the Plasma team. It's our flagship software in a way. Many people know us from that. It ships with the devices that we mentioned earlier. It's a desktop interface that ships. Uh, it ships with many Linux distribution. If you're learning, using a Linux distribution, it's possible that you're already using Plasma or you have a chance to use it if you're just using something else. And it ships in popular devices like Steam nowadays also. And then there are other teams that are not necessarily formed around you know, software development, let's say, but there are topics like design, where people discuss the looks and uh, feels and the user interface of our software. So you can contribute with your opinion there as well. There's the eco team that is concerned. Uh, we mentioned this in our goal as well, with making our software as energy efficient as possible and how we can extend the work we put into this to other open source projects as well, help them to, to be more energy efficient as well. There's the quality assurance themes that, you know, it focuses on introducing processes and, uh, you know, methods that improve the quality of code. So our software, it uh, ships uh, in a better uh, form um, and better quality to our users. So there are many, many more. Well, you already mentioned localization teams that translate the, our community to different, our products into different languages. So all of these can be a great step for you to be involved in our community, understand more about uh, our software and you know make your first step it, it vastly depends on what your entry point is what your interests are it needs to click something in you and then you can start finding the right team and getting involved right um and i think this brings us to the end of our presentation i think yes that's right so, yeah <laughs> so yeah so for questions yeah this point Let's turn the attention, I guess, to all of you watching. If you have any questions, things you want to ask about KDE, open source, academy or our event, or anything else that to your interest, we would be very, very happy to uh, hear your uh, questions. I think we can start with the local team, people watching us from the University of Macedonia. Maybe we can start with some questions from you, if there are any in the room. We don't have sound from the team there. So if anyone wants to ask something, just let us know. <laughs> if there are no questions, maybe we can turn to our online audience. I think at some point I noticed around 50, 60 people watching us there. I don't know if someone from our team can also inform us if we have any questions. If you don't ask us anything, we will start asking you. And we will be pointing <laughs> fingers and say. <laughs> I'm going to start asking the people with all the stickers on their laptops what those stickers yeah. are. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I see a lot of them. Hi. Um, so we have some questions from the remote attendees. Oh, hi, uh, the okay. first one yeah, is, sure. which languages do we need to know to start contributing? Hmm. OK, uh, I'll take this one. So. The answer is, uh, I'm, I'm going to assume, assume that the question is about software development. Um, I would say that probably the two biggest languages that are used in KDE are C++ and QML. C++, of course, is an industry standard. Everybody knows it. Um, QML is a user interface design language that has been created by the Qt company. And many pieces of KDE software are written in QML. So one thing that we often find when people start talking about development and they ask, oh, which languages should I know, um, is that they often greatly overestimate the amount that you need to know to start. 
So I'll talk a little bit about this personally. Um, let me start by saying I am not a, either a talented or a skilled programmer. Um, I have learned some programming over time, but I would say that it is very much not a natural thing for me. And I started contributing KDE code when I had almost no C++ knowledge. But the thing about KDE code is that because it's in the open, you can see what it's doing. And KDE code tends to be very well written in general. Um, it's very easy to understand. And so if you have any kind of previous programming background or experience, or let's say experience even with scripting languages or something, that was, that was my case is that I did not know C++, but I had done some scripting and Bash and Python and Perl. So if, you, if you're familiar with any kind of coding or scripting at all, then you kind of understand the structure of how code works. And your first contributions using a language that you don't understand can be very much a monkey see, monkey do type of thing, where you look at the code and you see what it's doing in one place and you can see, okay, if I copy that and modify it in like an easy way, then I can change it to do what I want. Um, in such a circumstance, you don't actually need to know very much at all, and you can learn over time by doing. But if you do want to formally study some languages that will help you in KDE, I would say uh, C++ in general. Uh, C++ using the Qt framework specifically, because all KDE software is based on uh, Qt's version of C++ and Qt libraries. Um, when I say Qt, I'm not using the word cute as in small and adorable. I'm, I'm pronouncing the, uh, the QT project the way they want it to be pronounced. It's actually not QT, they want it to be pronounced cute. Um, so so this, this cute toolkit is something that we use. Um, QML I found can be very approachable. It's something I had never used even a tiny bit before I used KDE, but I find QML to be a very, easy to learn language that newcomers can often get to grips with really quickly and really easily. Um, especially if you're sort of more of a user interface type person, I would really recommend looking into QML, do a quick tutorial, start working on some KDE QML code. That would be basically all of Plasma, a lot of modern apps, all of KDE's mobile apps, and some of KDE's older apps, which have recently been ported. Um, if you're more of like a back-end person, definitely focus on C++ and Qt. Um, if you tend to be more interested in compilers and stuff, uh, CMake is a good place to start. CMake is an industry standard build system. So yeah, those would be my recommendations for, for what to do and where to go. Um, thanks, Nate. So uh, I'm going to take one question from the remote attendees and one from the local audience. So the first question from the local audience is, will we see Rust being used in KDE projects? Are mm. there discussions related to using Rust and integrating into existing KDE frameworks? All right, I'll take this one too, if you don't mind. Um, so Rust is something that we're definitely seeing exploding in popularity. Um, one challenge of Rust is that the user interface toolkit story is not so mature right now. So one thing that we in KDE basically believe is that it's a bit premature to be saying we're going to rewrite everything in Rust. That said, Rust definitely has a place in backend code that is very memory intensive, that deals with low level stuff where you really don't want it to crash. We are in fact seeing some small movements towards porting um, crash prone C++ code to Rust. I know that there's currently uh, an initiative to do this for KDE's Aquanadi email and calendaring and personal information management system. Um, a KDE contributor named Carl Schwann is currently rewriting part of this in Rust. So in terms of, I would say, targeted applications where Rust can make sense, we're definitely starting to move towards this. Um, we're not anti-Rust in, in any way, but I would say that when it comes to writing an entire application in Rust, that's a little bit premature because KDE has a very mature library of user interface components, uh, both on the C++ side and also on the QML side. And that story is much less well-developed for Rust. So we're going to be taking it mostly for backend things right now. Uh, 
Thanks, Nate. So we have another question. In fact, we have many questions around 12 or 13 questions up till now. Oh, good. Yeah. So the other one is what are the short and mid goals of the KDE Plasma Mobile? Would you like to uh, do this one, Neofitos, or should I talk about it? The short end? I didn't get the second part of the question. It, they're asking what are the short and mid goals for Plasma Mobile? No, Nate, feel free. You're much more involved in the development. Okay, sure. Um, I was hoping you knew more about Plasma Mobile than I did um, because I'm actually not super involved in Plasma Mobile. I have a little bit of contact with it. Um, so I can talk in broad outlines here, um, but not tons of specifics. So Plasma Mobile, um, of course, is targeting mobile phones and, and also tablets. I think probably the the biggest goal of Plasma Mobile right now is to improve the distribution story. Um, when you have a an x86 based computer, it's relatively simple to install Linux on it because you just get a Linux distro, everything uses x86, there's no problem. But for mobile phones, they all use ARM based hardware and everything ARM is kind of weird and custom. Um, so definitely one thing that we think would would make Plasma Mobile more accessible is somehow improving the distribution story there and working to get Plasma Mobile as a software stack much more widely available on many different kinds of hardware without it being a sort of custom per device thing. Um, I know that there has have been some efforts on that and some partnerships with other distros. Um, in my opinion, this is probably the biggest thing that needs to happen. Um, but the way it, it generally works right now, because there isn't a super general purpose thing, it means that anybody who wants to integrate Plasma Mobile onto a device needs to do some custom work. And so we've seen some interest from device manufacturers, from hardware partners. Um, essentially, if you want Plasma Mobile on your device, you need to either be a super nerd volunteer who can do it yourself, or you need to put professional development time into making it work. Um, I think Plasma Mobile is already pretty awesome. I've used it a little bit. Um, it, it definitely could benefit from more exposure, more real world usage, more development, but I think it's definitely got a, a bright future when it comes to um, fighting against the uh, proprietary platforms. Just to add to what Nate already mentioned, uh, a big part of this, as Nate, I think it it touched upon it is a hardware limitation in terms of it's not just plasma that needs to improve it's at the same time it's like the hardware that runs in the phones right so in order to be at the state that would be usable by the majority of people so uh, plasma by is already uh, on many devices hundreds of devices actually we mentioned that the the, um, the pine phone that were kitty ship plasma mobile ship there by default but to to a large extent what plasma and not just plasma other you know similar uh, environments that are meant to be used on a arm based phone they are very limited by the hardware under it and Nate already mentioned several issues with that there's many many different things that one needs to take into consideration in order to something to work it's not like a computer that it's much more standardized nowadays you can run, run a distribution on it and it will automatically run by default and set up everything and things like that so uh, Plasma Mobile is developing, but what you see is uh, it not, you know, being out there and getting into the people's hands is mostly limited by the the level of the hardware that we have available to us now. You know, it needs to be open source. It needs to, we need to have access to drivers that you know in order to improve, let's say, for example, the graphics card or the calling or things like that. So many aspects of it are limited by these kind of situations. You you need to you you're able to maybe make it work on one device but you have many many issues making it to work on two or three and or hundreds of devices so it's not just a problem plasma is facing everyone developing software in this you know field you will see that uh, they have similar issues so we're working on it but hopefully we'll have the hardware at some point where we can you know pre prepare something more massive let's say or mass production that will get to the hands yeah. of many for now, it's mostly for developers and people you know, that are enthusiastic and want to test things out and how things are improving. It has progressed over the last, I remember back when I joined, it was just an idea. And over the last years, we've seen it ship on phones, right? And improve if you 
come to any of our events, you will see that how the devices are improving from year to year and how they are much more responsive, how they can run apps nowadays. There are much, much more apps that you can download on your system and things like that. But still, for day-to-day -day usage, we have a long way to you know, uh, walk towards that. Yeah, I think the example with the Pine Phone really illustrates the path forward here because <clears throat> with the Pine Phone, this was a very inexpensive device that came pre-configured with Plasma Mobile. And so you didn't have to do any of the super difficult installation and firmware flashing process to get it on there. Uh, and so I think basically, uh, you're going to hear me talk about this a lot, but I think more partnerships with hardware vendors um, is definitely, in addition to being the way forward for KDE software in general, I think it's especially going to be the case for Plasma Mobile because mobile phones Mobile phone hardware tends to be so custom and there is so much lockdown proprietary firmware. So we definitely need for people selling this hardware to put in some of the work of making the software work on it. Anyway, I'll shut up about Plasma Mobile because I know there are other questions. Yes, we do. So there are two questions related to quality assurance. I'm going to read both of them together so that uh, maybe they are just integrated. So the first one is from the local community. How can we get involved to contributing to the quality assurance of the KD ecosystem? Um, the other one is to, co to contribute in the quality assurance. Are there any recommended minimum setup or configuration preferred by the groups? Hmm. All right, let me start with this one. Uh, this is another subject quite close to me. Uh, technically, my job title in Blue Systems is QA manager. So I have a, a lot to say about this topic. Uh, quality assurance is definitely something that KDE can hugely benefit from. Uh, I would say if you wanna get involved in quality assurance, there is a link at our Get Involved, uh, at our Get Involved page. Maybe I can find it real fast while I'm, while I'm talking here. Um, there's a whole bunch of things you can do. So probably the first one is use KDE software um, because if you're using it, that's the best way to find issues and QA related stuff with it. Um, the next thing that you can do is bug triage, as I as I mentioned earlier. Um, once you once you find an issue, submit a bug report for it on our official bug tracker. Do your best to report all the necessary information. Um, start working on bug triage for other issues and in the process you will probably start to notice a whole bunch of different things that will that uh that you didn't even know were bugs because you don't use those features um, you'll start to get a sort of a ten thousand foot view of the entire project which is important so in terms of minimum setup for using kde software i would always recommend using relatively recent versions of stuff. So that means don't use Debian stable. Uh, don't use an old Ubuntu LTS version. Um, always try to be using as close as possible to the most recent versions, because otherwise you're just gonna waste a lot of time. You'll find issues that have been fixed weeks, months, or even years ago, and it's not a good use of your time. So be using like a rolling release distro or a semi-rolling distro or um, a discrete release distro that you always have upgraded to the latest version, uh, like Ubuntu non-LTS versions like Fedora KDE. Um, uh, KDE Neon can be a good platform too. You can always run KDE Neon or any other distro in a virtual machine too. Uh, if you are worried about polluting your local system with unstable packages, uh, as you can see from the hiccup I had earlier, that's definitely a risk, a thing that can happen when you're doing QA type stuff. Um, one thing that I will say about QA is that KDE has in general been improving on the QA front. We have, uh, we have a lot of people who are using our software and who are reporting bugs, what we don't have right now. And this is something I feel very strongly about. What we don't have is a strong pipeline within KDE from QA to development. Because often something that happens is that people find issues, they submit bug reports, the bug report gets confirmed, it accumulates duplicates, and then nothing happens. Nobody fixes it. Um, and so what we are desperately in need of is people who want to volunteer within KDE specifically to fix issues that 
the QA team and QA people find? Because simply finding issues isn't enough, right? Like the whole point of QA is to find the issues and then somebody fixes them. So it's a two-step process. Uh, I would say we are definitely, 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 definitely in need of more people who are willing to work on QA issues rather than the fun, sexy work, which is making new features, you know, redesigning the way buttons are shaped, increasing the corner radius. That's all fun, right? What's a lot less fun is fixing boring bugs that you don't experience yourself. Um, so if, if that's something that you want to help out with, please, I implore anybody here who wants to do development topics, uh, pay attention to the QA stuff. Um, and people who want to do QA stuff, please faithfully submit bug reports against modern versions and help to triage existing bug reports to make sure that the state of the bug tracker is accurate. Um, because that's how it becomes actionable when it faithfully reflects reality. Um, I could go on forever, but I will ramble incoherently. So I'm going to stop here unless anybody has variants of that question that they want to, uh, yes. to ask. There is a follow-up question related to that. Um, they are saying that we were asking about specifically about code quality. Um, okay, so that's, that's definitely another topic. Uh, I find that in general, the quality of code in KDE is approximately 500% better than at any other place I've ever encountered, including the professional companies that I've worked at. Um, because everything is out in the open, anybody can see the code and improve the code because the kinds of people who are attracted to KDE tend to be pedantic nerds. We never find a shortage of people who are interested in improving code quality in porting to new APIs. So if this is a topic that interests you, I think KDE is a really great place to volunteer because you will find a lot of like-minded people who care very deeply about code quality, code correctness, fixing bugs in the right location rather than, you know, shipping ugly workarounds. Um, I would say sometimes KDE focuses on these things to a fault. Sometimes we find that an issue that is a prominent issue doesn't get fixed because we want to take the time to fix it in the correct way. And the correct way takes more time to fix it than doing an ugly workaround. And in a commercial company, it would be the opposite, right? Your boss is breathing down your neck. Your boss says, who cares? Ship the ugly workaround. We'll fix it later. The customer is happy and then the code quality suffers. Eventually the product becomes an unmaintainable mess and a new one is shipped and then you get to sell a new thing to customers. So that's the way it works everywhere else, but definitely not within KDE. Um, we have guidelines for code quality that can be found all over the place. But in general, I find that the kinds of people who contribute to KDE are simply people who care deeply about this topic as a matter of their inherent personality. So if that's you, you will find a home here for sure. So we have another follow-up question. Um, you have mentioned software being used in academic scientific settings. Are there any efforts or projects right now related to academia? Would you like to take this one, Neofita? Yeah, sure. Uh, if you've seen the slide, I don't know if I can go back to it. If you go there into that webpage, it's kd.org slash four slash scientists, if I recall correctly. Those are all soft, you can find their software that we develop. And I think we also have a recommendation for software that we don't develop, but can run very well together with our software and make it interest you. Those are applications that we are currently developing and there are teams around them. So uh, if you want uh, to contribute to one of them or use any of them, um, feel free to download and you know install them and start using them. I don't know if this was the intention of the um, question, but hopefully that helped. Okay, so the next question is, have you guys ever considered using Rust, Go, Zig as a replacement for C++? So let me take that one. Um, when I'm uh, asked this question, I often like to pose a question back to the asker, which is, have you ever considered putting a an airplane's jet engine into a boat to power it. Such a thing is probably possible, right? They're both engines, they're both vehicles, they both burn fuel to get from point A to point B. 
but the devil's in the details, right? Because they do these things in very different ways. They have different form factors. They consume fuel at different rates. They have different characteristics. And it's the same thing with programming languages, right? Uh, because KDE code is based on Qt and C++, we have literally millions, tens, maybe even hundreds of millions of lines of code that use C++. So just replace it with Rust or just replace it with Go is kind of the equivalent of saying, delete all of KDE and start over from scratch. It's kind of not a feasible proposal. Um, what we can do is in a targeted manner, use different programming languages and different programming paradigms and different toolkits in places where it makes sense because C++ is showing its limitations. Uh, I think we've definitely seen this in terms of crashiness and there is some interest in using Rust in the back end, as I mentioned earlier, to uh, improve the memory safety and crash resistance of KDE code. But in, in general, suggestions to just rewrite everything in Rust are not really actionable. Um, you have to you have to see where it makes sense to do. You know, for a new project, sure, write it in whatever language you want. But as I think we've mentioned, KDE is 27 years old at this point. KDE has is a multi generational institution. We have a lot of software. We have a lot of code. It may it may be difficult to understand just how much code there is. Um, so it, it's kind of not feasible to say just rewrite everything in some fancy new thing. So the next question is, are there any um, in-person events in Asia? Uh, to my knowledge, in terms of KDE, uh, maybe Anika, you are more, you know. I was actually uh, thinking the same. Yeah, you are more well positioned to talk about that, so feel free. Uh, um, Anika yeah, is part, just to introduce you, I don't know if people are listening, Anika is part of the uh, KDE team that helps us on community and promotional issues. So she has much more knowledge than what we need on this front. Anika, go ahead. So we are trying to do in-person events, but not uh, directly related to KDE, but we are participating in different events related to FOSS or non-technical events. Um, if you, in fact, know somewhere we can contribute or we can participate or you can represent KDE, please get in touch with us and we can definitely do something in Asia. Recently, we participated in FOSS Asia in Singapore, and I guess we can do many more events. In fact, we are participating in two more events in India in the coming months. So, yeah. Good, and I, I think we have the KD Network Asia as well. Right? Yes, we do. We do. So maybe you can, I can share the links in the chat. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So you can find there other people from Asia or interested in know in Asia and there you can organize together things or right. let me also let me also mention that this is a great translation opportunity um, we find that KDE is often underrepresented in Asia for the simple reason that our software is often not translated into the many languages of Asia so if anybody here um, knows any of those languages it's a super impactful way to contribute you know, because there are there are hundreds, billions of people who speak languages that KDE software is not well translated into. So definitely take a look at, at that. Okay, so the next question is a bit long, so I'll try to um, go slowly. Um, as I have been working through building frameworks and Plasma, which I have not yet been fully successful, I have found differences between the wiki and the versions of KDE tools, which I am using. This has discouraged me from making corrections to the wiki. I can imagine having different versions of the wiki pages, each associated with the release of KDE. Kind of like how python.org uh, lets you choose a version of the python.org page based on a specific Python version. Who can help me with this? So uh, this is a good point. I think you've definitely found a place where our documentation could stand to be improved. Maybe this is possible to do on a wiki. I'm not sure. Um, I know we have some wiki experts here who could maybe chime in. Um, but in, in general, this sort of very targeted question 
it's actually good to go straight to the source. So I would encourage you to go to the KDE Devel room um, and ask your question there and start a conversation about onboarding. Onboarding is a topic is, that is super important. Uh, I know it's particularly important to Neophytos, who was the leader of the onboarding goal several years ago. So maybe I will hand the rest of the question off to, to you at this point. Yeah, the, the idea is started again from personal experience. So similarly, how a person here is trying to do something and they find an issue. That's how I started, uh, you know, working on this goal. And then I realized that it's not just me, other people will have this issue. And I thought, okay, maybe I can help on that front. And I stepped up and suggested some processes or some, you know, ideas on how we can move this forward in order to help with onboarding people. Obviously, documentation in the wiki is a big part of it. It's very, very helpful, particularly for developers or for the people that are interested in developing code. We do currently have people uh, actually being employed by Kitty to improve our documentation because we feel this is something very, very important. And we continue to, to work upon that. But of course, if you find something that you need, you feel like it could be improved, feel free to reach out the documentation team there's probably an email next to uh, where you found the documentation so you can reach out to someone or maybe even suggest your own changes or maybe try to get some help on how you can commit those changes to our wiki so you know your problems uh, maybe you can fix them and help other people to not have those problems going forward so I, that would be an ideal scenario or maybe we can help you with that if you found something. Yeah, let me mention one final thing. Um, the development uh, onboarding page that we have is something that has been subject to a lot of revision over time because people approach with so many different setups. Some people want to use Arch, which is easy. Some people want to use Debian Stable, which is hard. Some people want to use Windows, which is impossible unless you use a VM. So it, it may indeed make sense to have multiple versions of this wiki page. And then uh, you, you, know, you, you choose your platform, you say what environment you're using, and then you get a set of documentation that works specifically for that platform. I, I could see that making sense. Um, that said, it's a wiki, which means anybody can update it and change it. So uh, I would really encourage you to if you don't feel comfortable actually making such a change, reach out to other people in the KDE Devel room, um, in, in other similar places and propose the topic, right? Um, get some agreement on it. And, and then if there is agreement on it, make that change. That can be a really great way to get started um, because the people who are struggling with documentation are usually the best people to improve the documentation as, as counterintuitive as that sounds. Yeah, and talking to other people will give you feedback on, you know, is it what you saw valid? Is it worth looking into? And maybe also give you some guidance on how to work on improving it, right? So don't be shy, reach out, and I'm sure people will be happy to help you. Okay, so the next question we have, have you thought for a storytelling app with scenario structure and timeline characters and plot design and different pathways? Hmm, like Scrivener, I guess, um, maybe. Uh, I am not aware of anything like that currently within KDE. It, maybe I'm wrong. There are so many apps, it's hard to keep track. Uh, it sounds like a good idea. I think that this may be one of those things where you can scratch your own itch. Um, if it's something that you'd like to see, be the change you want to see in the world. Yeah, maybe it's a good point to point out how the community works. Like we are a bit, let's say, autonomous in that way and self-driven. So it's not like we get together and decide, hey, we need to develop this app. And then we tell people, you and you and you go work on this app. It's usually quite the opposite. It's uh, like a bottom-up approach. People get together, they find a need for some specific app or they find a use case for a specific app. They have interest in developing it. They start and then because we're a big community, if you start on something, then it's very easy for someone else to jump and help you know someone it will catch the interest of someone else if you announce it i want to do this as long as it's it's you know it fits under our manifesto and the way we do things it's very easy to pick it up and then once you start working on it where you will find other i'm pretty sure you'll find other people with 
similar interest and you know start growing your project so yeah so the next question yeah no go ahead okay so the next question is can one contribute to the Qt 6 migration without having to have a local Qt 5 setup? Uh, I'll take this one. Yes, it's possible. Um, I think it makes it a little bit more difficult because not all software is currently ported to Qt 6. So without having Qt 5, you won't be able to run anything that isn't ported, which may make porting a little bit more challenging. But in principle, if you want to be very adventurous, you can have only Qt 6. And when you find an app that doesn't build or doesn't run on Qt 6, you can just immediately port it and get it working. So yeah, feel free. Sounds good. It sounds like an adventure. So I would say get started and see what happens. So the next question is, how to create new holidays for a given country in the plasma panels date widget. Okay, so that one is fairly straightforward. Uh, the holidays data lives in a KDE framework called K holidays. So you would find that framework on invent.kde.org, check out the code, uh, find the place for your country's holidays, follow the pattern, add a new holiday, and uh, submit a merge request for it. So the next question is, um, what versioning tools or platforms are being used by KDE, Git, Mercurial, et cetera? I feel like I've been talking too much. Neofitos, would you like to take this one or should I? It's okay, it's okay, Nate. I mean, you are the expert on the development front. So oh gosh, I'm, I'm an, an expert. expert. I'm if, I'm an ex <laughs> if, if I'm an expert in development, then the world is in trouble. Um, I should definitely not be considered an expert in development. But anyway, uh, so KDE predominantly uses Git. One exception is the translation system still uses SVN. I'm not aware of us using Mercurial or anything else anywhere. Um, so yeah. Okay, so the next question is, does KDE Eco also have opportunities to contribute code which doesn't involve writing benchmarking code? I don't know the answer to that question. That's my, my first response would be to say yes. I don't know, Nate, if you know something more, but I would strongly urge you to reach out to the KDE Eco people and ask your question there. There's a chat on Matrix and there's a mailing list as well. Uh, it's a new project, so it's very active and we have very many people on board. So I'm pretty confident that you'll get an immediate response if you show interest in contributing. Um, I don't know, Nate, if you have anything more to add. Yeah, I can add a little bit. I think this is fairly similar to the QA question um, and the structure is similar where any good quality assurance effort consists of two parts. Part number one is identify the issues. Part number two is fix them. Um, so benchmarking is definitely important to find issues, but of course, if we have everything benchmarked and nobody knows how to fix them, the whole exercise was completely pointless, right? So the point of benchmarking is to identify places that need to be fixed. Um, so if you have more interest in fixing code to make it run in a more efficient way, then that's, that's basically step two of the eco process. So definitely get involved there. Um, it's kind of like how QA, um, QA first involves finding issues, reporting them, and then ultimately fixing them. Because if, if they don't get fixed, then what was the point? So we have only four minutes left. Um, I'm just going to pick two some questions now. Uh, this one is really interesting. Can I use con key character in my games? Interesting. That's a license question. Um, I'm not the strongest on licensing. Would you like to speak on this a little bit, Neofitos? Uh, I I seem to recall that 
uh, Coinkey's license, uh, as Katie, whether an open source license or, you know, copyleft license. I don't recall exactly the one. Uh, I think we have a website that's dedicated to that, and you can check there the license from me. Um, fine. In any case, my answer would be I'm pretty, if, especially if you give contribution, I'm pretty confident it will not be an issue like say that Coinkey was developed by Katie and have a link or something that should cover it most most of the time. So, yeah. All right. I don't so know. I paste I, the page in the chat. Awesome. Okay. So the next question is, are there any projects in the KDE world that is developing support for VR or AR hardware? So I'll take this one very briefly. Um, I know that in the KWIN window manager, we are explicitly supporting VR headsets. I'm not aware of any ongoing project within KDE to do something in a more user space direction, uh, like VR plasma or VR dolphin. Um, sounds interesting, but I don't think we're doing that at the moment. Okay. There's another question. Um, what do you think the biggest next step would be to move KDE closer to the world domination compared to the things oh, KDE software can already do? Um, I don't know if I can do this in two minutes. I will try in like 10 seconds. Uh, more I hardware think, I think software. Nate has a, a talk at the Academy about that, so you should join us. I do, yeah, you can see that. <laughs> I have a few at this point. Um, if you go to my website, pointstick.com, there's a whole category called world domination. Um, so you can see my thoughts on that subject in a more extended session. Sorry, I took over your date, so feel free to. That's fine. Yeah, I, I think you had the right idea to, to point people there. But okay. in a nutshell, hardware, sell hardware. So make it easy for people to use our software without going through the, you know, through the whole download something, get it yep. on, uh, you know, an ISO, install it, do some, you know, fixes, yep. and then you're ready to go. The idea is you get the device, you start using the software, you don't ask any questions, what is, what does it run and things like that. But it's something that are smooth with quality of software and, you know, people just use it. Most people will not think it with their software. They will use whatever it comes into their hands. So if it's fine and it works, they will be happy with it. So yep. add what I had in that front. It's like two percent of the population that can install an ISO on, you know, on a device, right? Like nobody can do that. We can. We're weird, but most people cannot do that. Okay, one last question, and then we are going to outro. Um, how are partnership with vendors initiated? Um, are there any specific groups for it? Very good question. Um, that's a good place to end too. So this is something that the board is involved with quite a lot. Um, and Neofitos has been a board member in the past. I'm a current board member. So both of us could talk a little bit more about this if we wanted to, but in general, uh, hardware vendor partnerships are intermediated through the board. If the vendor is also a KDE patron, there are other cases where the vendor is not a KDE patron. One example is Valve with the Steam Deck. Um, Valve does not have a personal relationship with KDE. Instead, Valve has a relationship with the company I work for, Blue Systems. Um, and so in that case, the relationship is, is managed externally. And those of us who work at those companies wear multiple hats. So, you know, right now I'm wearing my KDE hat, but then right after I sign off here, I'm actually going to go to work and I'm going to put on my Blue Systems hat and I'm probably, I'm going to attempt faithfully to represent KDE's interests in that partnership. Um, I, there are some other ones that work that way. So in general, it's through third party companies or through the board. Anika? Yeah. Um, we had more questions, but now because uh, the time has ended, so I'm just going to ask the university if they could just um, do the conclusion of the session. Uh, okay, so I want to close this event. <clears throat> I want to wait. Can you see me? <laughs> uh, I want to thank our speak speakers, Nate and Neoftos. I want to thank everybody here for attending, and thank everybody who is attending online.
Uh, all the slides that the guys have presented us here will be sent in the email you've used uh, for your registration. And we hope to see you all in the upcoming Academy, third week of July from 15th to 21st. So thank you for uh, this great workshop. Thank you, like uh, all the people there that work and actually put all the hard work to organize this at the local level, but also behind the scenes, I know there are people working on the streaming and, you know, managing questions and things like that. So many, many thanks to all of you for setting this up and giving us the opportunity to talk about KDE and ourselves, right? And how we plan to dominate the world. So, yeah. Thank you so much. I, I would say this is probably the most polished and professional conferencing setup I've ever seen. I'm super impressed. I've even noticed that the camera focuses on the person who's closest to the microphone that's recording the loudest audience. This is amazing stuff. So you should be very proud of the setup that you have here. Um, definitely thank you for inviting us here to, to yammer on about KDE for a while. Um, it's something that we're all very passionate about. And I hope that something that we said can be interesting and useful and actionable to those of you in the audience as well. So thank you very much for your time. And come and meet us, right? So the academy, two months from now, yep. right there at the University of uh, Macedonia. We'll be Especially very, very those nice. who are local. You have no excuse. You have to come to academy. Exactly. <laughs> Great. Take good care, people. Thank you.